Episode 125 of the Interpretation Station is called to order. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a brand new episode of the Interpretation Station. And in what is going to be the second in our series of meeting the big players and the big names, the hot shots in the language industry. Uh, if you watched, I think it was maybe episode 120 or 121, a couple few weeks ago, uh, we spoke to Phil Braselman from Thrive Fount. Uh, he has his own translation agency. He's based uh, in, in well, he's actually based in Hungary, uh, works mainly with German. And so I'm gonna put a card up to that. Uh, episode up there so you can go and see that's gonna be very relevant to you as I say if, if you if you've got German in your combination you're working in Europe maybe that maybe fills the guy to help you now for today uh, we've got a very special guest on our show uh, today as I say as I continue my journey of self-discovery stepping outside from behind the um the same um but today we have with us the man who gave me my sort of start as it were, in the YouTube industry. It was for the first time I was actually a guest on somebody's show. Now, this was about a, a year ago that uh, I appeared on this gentleman's uh, show. Uh, his YouTube channel is called uh, Freelance Translator Tips. So we had a good old chat about all things to do with interpreting at the time. I'll also leave a link to that episode. You can see how that, that was on my guest's channel. So my guest, to give him, her na to give him a name, is Mr. Robert Gebhardt. So uh, Robert, as I say, he is the creator. He is the man behind the YouTube channel Freelance Translator Tips. And his agency is called uh, Lugano Translations. So, well, I could tell you a bit more about it. maybe the best person to give the floor to so that he can tell you more about what he does for a start, give, give you some background on what his agency does is Robert himself. So Robert, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, and I'm honored that I was able to be the first to uh, invite you for uh, an interview for talking on uh, on another channel. And um, and uh, it's good to be on your channel. Ah, oh, well, well, welcome, welcome. Now, just before I like actually, so just before Robert goes on, I should point out that uh, this is actually the, the second time me and Robert have spoken in the last three days. And you may ask yourself, well, why is this? You must be very good friends. Uh, the actual reason is we did this interview actually originally on Saturday morning two days ago, but uh, this guy here, he forgot to bloody switch the, he pressed the record button. So he did the whole interview and lo and behold, at the end of it, nothing. I'd forgot. So here we are again. Anyway, here we are again. <laughs> that was a good this dress time, recording. It, was, it yeah. was a good dress rehearsal that we had, certainly. Exactly. Yeah. So sorry, Robert. I give the floor back to you. Tell tell the viewers about what you do. Tell them about your company, your agency. Well, uh, uh, as you mentioned, it's Lugano Translations. My background is as a freelance translator, and uh, so I went from being a freelance translator to running my own agency which is, uh, like I said, Lugano Translations, and it specializes in uh, legal and business translations and now crypto. And uh, it mainly deals with, I would say, Western European and East Asian languages, although we've done a number of other languages. So if you're interested in other languages, you can check there, but otherwise French, Italian, German, Spanish, and uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. And uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. But you know, it's interesting because you've worked all around a bit. So as, as Robert said, so he's originally from uh, from Lugano, very nice city, but if you have to go there, I went there about a year ago, lovely place. And then he, and then he moved for a while. He was living in the Carolinas, right? Is it North Carolina? North Carolina. So I was, and actually I was living sort of all over the place. I, and um, being, while I was a freelance translator, I, and along with my wife, we uh, lived in, uh, well, in Taiwan, in Shanghai, in uh, Atlanta, and uh, Washington, D.C. in the U.S. We lived in Lugano in Switzerland, in Lucca, which is in Tuscany, in Italy. And so we really lived the life of a digital nomad. Nomads, eh? That, yeah. that was uh, the, the cool term. And, uh, and so, yeah. And late, more lately, we've been, yes, we were in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, we've uh, just recently moved here to, uh, Ty to Taiwan. And, Taiwan, so that's, uh, that's an interesting, yeah, it's quite a big change, eh? Or not, I mean, you said yes. you actually were, were you, you, this is, you coming back to sort of Taiwan, right? You were there before? 
I've been to Taiwan before and I'm back here now. Uh, that part, it, it's a bit easier to be in Taiwan because uh, my wife is Taiwanese. And so we don't have to worry too much about, um, you know, permits and stuff like that. Okay. Now with all these different places that you've lived in, um, does the nature of the work, has the nature of the work changed much, much for you? Can you say there's much difference between working in Europe as compared to working uh, in the States or in, in Asia? Because it's very interesting to have someone like you who has sort of, well, he's been worked in the three biggest continents around the world. Um, so, th yeah, there are plenty of differences, but I haven't really encountered them, I should say, uh, because all of my work is online. And so I, um, whether I'm here or anywhere else, I'm usually working with either the same clients or finding new clients and doing stuff. Everything is online. So the biggest difference, the biggest issue I have is usually the, uh, the time difference. Um, like, here it's evening and it's daytime for you and so you i have to schedule things um according to uh according to that but otherwise the issues i encounter are more um you know trying to set up shop maybe legal issues or stuff like that lately uh i've been trying to do a lot more networking uh in the area that i'm in before i was trying to be completely virtual and i never liked networking face to face even before COVID and all that but lately, I've been trying to join local associations and, um, and chambers of commerce and stuff like that and try to take advantage more of where I am uh, geographically. I've um, noticed that because you, you, you were the chair. You were, what was your position at the Carolina, Carolina Association of Translators and Interpreters? Right. So there in Charlotte, I was, I was the treasurer for the Carolina Association of Translators and Interpreters. And there it was, uh, yeah, I decided I wanted to join and kind of be active, be part of the board. And so I joined as treasurer. And, um, and, and yeah, until recently, and then here in, uh, in Taiwan, I joined the European Chamber and stuff like that. So I'm, uh, I'm trying to do more of that. Um, but otherwise, all my business and pretty much everything is done online. Robert actually got me a speaking gig at the Carolina Association of Interpreters a few months ago. That was quite good. So if any of them are watching, if any of you guys from Carolina happen to be watching this episode, big hi to you out there. I remember there was Javier. He was the, he was the president, wasn't he? Javier? Yeah, Javier uh, Castillo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and it was a good, it was a big hit, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a good, it was, it was fun to do. It was fun to do. Uh, and so tell me, so the, the majority of, okay, so the, what, what maybe budding translators want to know um, is, so the majority of the people who work for you, are they, where are they from? And what sort of, what's the sort of split around the world, European, American, Chinese? Well, the people who work, for me, so so these are the freelance translators, mm -hmm. and um, and they are kind of all over all over the world. Uh, now lately, there there's been a lot of growth. I would say in Asian languages, Chinese and Korean, at least in terms of what I'm doing. And uh, so those translators are located in China, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, you know, places like that. And uh, so, but I work with translators all over the globe, really. And, uh, and in many different places and many interesting places as well. Like I said, those are my, my main, lang main languages, but every now and then I get very interesting um, requests that I can or cannot fulfill. And recently I had a request uh, for a translation phone, phone to English. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. That is a language they speak in Benin in Africa. And I was actually able to find a translator who, uh, uh, translates from phone to English or phone to French, but also, yeah, phone to English. Um, and, uh, and so that was interesting. Well, there you go. For um, any potential customers who are looking for translation into phone language, Robert's your man. He can find a guy. Does the guy want a quick plug? Uh, sure. His name is Epifan. And uh, he, um, and yeah, he, uh, he translates, like I said, uh, from phone into French and French into phone. And he said, you know, depending on the, on the subject matter, he could do English as well. And, um, and so, yeah, feel free to uh, contact him for all your phone language needs. There you go, for all your phone language needs. Very good, very good. And you do so, as I say, you're, you're, in, you're in Taiwan. Do you work much with, with, main, uh, the main, with mainland China or with the other, like Hong Kong and uh, Macau, that sort of thing? Is there much contact? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, uh, quite a bit. Um, not so much Macau, but I definitely work with Hong Kong and uh, mainland China. And, um, and yeah, you know, there's quite. So what will happen is I'll have a client in Switzerland who needs something translated um, in Chinese. And, you know, because their client is in uh, mainland China or, you know, okay. anyway, it'll be, it'll be something like that. And, uh, and so I'll handle their translation. 
One of the advantages we have as an agency is that we're able to do, we, we have translators who do directly from French to Chinese or Italian to Chinese or Italian to Korean without using English as an intermediary. And, um, and that's actually quite rare in the translation world. Yeah, now you were telling me about this. I thought that was very, very interesting, actually. Um, because we were talking also about um, potential good combinations for, for translators to be sort of cultivating. And um, what, what do you think, I mean, uh, what are the sort of good combinations perhaps to have looking to the future? Well, I, in my experience, those are good combinations. If you can find, uh, you know, because just because based on what I've seen, I've seen a lot of growth in stuff like that. So stuff in East Asian, like say Korean to French, Korean to German, Korean. German to Chinese to Japanese, stuff like that, without using English as an intermediary, then I think um, you'll be able to, you know, if you're good at what you do, you'll be able to get clients, you'll be able to charge a decent price. And, uh, and I think you're in a good position. And so I usually recommend that. I get asked this a lot, like what language combination should I concentrate on? And people usually ask for some reason, which one's most popular? Which one has, um, I guess, because which one has most demand, but whichever one has most demand also has mo more supply. And right. so if you are, you know, one of the most common combinations is probably Spanish and English, especially in the US and stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so a lot of people want to get into that. Of course, then you're-, you're But then you've got with... masses of supply, and then you've got masses of competition, haven't you? Right, exactly. But if you are, you know, a French to Korean translator and you're good at what you do, you know, you've got three competitors, quite frankly, you know, if that. And um, and so it's uh, it, it, it becomes very different. And I think it's a lot better to be niched in that sense. Um, I mean, I can attest however, to that from my own experience, definitely, because, um, well, like at my work, I mean, that's the everyone so, so to have either uh french and uh french and spanish into english or, or russian and spanish into english um but obviously so there's masses so there's more generally more there's more demand let's say for having the spanish but that's what everyone does is the french and spanish it's such a kind of a, it's an easy-ish sort of um combination to have you know the sort of classic romance language combination for a russian there, there's let much less demand than for Spanish, but if you know, again, uh, there's also much less supply, and uh, actually gives you perhaps a bit more, a few more options actually when you have the slightly less, um, the less common language. So it's definitely um, these sort of slightly more niche languages. I think there's definitely something to be said for trying to trying to add one. If if, you, if you've got the mainstream ones, great, but. Uh, try and add a niche one right and i guess it's the same yeah. in the translation yes try to add an exactly try to add a niche one or even sometimes a dialect um i, I was talking to a, a, tr a literary translator and she is um probably the only if uh, definitely one of one of the only if not the only uh translator from swiss german into italian and i was asking her how she got into the business and she said because she she did german to italian and uh, but then the moment she decided to add Swiss German, suddenly she's the only one out there who can do it. Right. And, right. Um, and you know, so Swiss, you know, authors write in Swiss German as well, especially if they want to make it quite Swiss. And so if she's able to uh, do stuff like that, obviously she's not translating legal documents or stuff like that, but it is still a niche. And suddenly she was became quite well known because of that. So it was um, it's quite interesting. Yeah. I think certainly people have to do their quite actually a bit of research into exactly okay what if you okay you want to be a translator and interpreter, and then you but you want to actually plan it quite carefully as to what to focus on. I had someone who asked me uh, via the, the YouTube channel the other day was it LinkedIn that she's an Arabic speaker, native Arabic, Arabic English, and um, she wants she'd like to work at the UN at some point, and she's like thinking, do I add French or Spanish? French or Spanish? And she asked me, what should I tell you? I said, definitely 100% go for the French because there's, there's no requirement. There's, there's Arabic and Spanish, it's nice to have, but no one actually wants that combination. People want the oh. Arabic, English, French combination. If you have the Spanish as an added thing, that's not very nice. That's great. But if you don't have the French, sorry. And it's even the same, like if you've got uh, if you're an English native speaker, you got Russian and Spanish. It's going to be tricky. It's going to be tricky. 
you know, without the French. You, so you really, I, I mean, I'd say at least for interpreting and probably for translation, you probably want to just do your research before you, you know, throw yourself into it. Identify exactly what uh, what the language combo, best language combo for you is. And that's interesting. Do you think is that a UN thing or is that in general for interpreting? So, uh, UN definitely, but generally, I mean, all, most of these organi organizations work along similar lines. What's also a bit different is other organizations have uh, interpreting two way two way booths where you'll just be like. So, I don't know, English, Spanish, you'll be working either, you know, into English or into Spanish, where that doesn't count. But also for a lot of these organizations where they want you to have like a combination going into your native tongue, you need to make sure that you have the combination that's going to fit nicely into what, uh, into what they're searching for. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, um, I, I don't work with the UN and also I don't work in interpreting. So this is yeah. new to me, yeah. By the way, it's interesting you say, but so you're getting a lot of um, work in crypto now. So when did that Late. start? Is this is this yeah, a Late. new is this a new burgeoning sort of industry? I mean, from a from so, a translation point of view, it, it's new. And actually, I wrote something about this on on LinkedIn. It's new. Uh, it might be burgeoning, or it might be a bubble that's going to fizzle out. But you know, it's been going on about ten years now. So. I decided it's probably going to go on at least another year, let's say. So it's probably worth investing some energy and, you know, and time and effort into uh, getting some good translators who, who know about blockchain. Now, for me, what actually happened was I, was I was asked about blockchain ahead of time. And so I kind of looked into it and I was able to handle uh, for, for this one bank um, a, um, a translation that had to do with with crypto and uh and so that kind of sparked the interest and i looked into it a bit more and yeah and now that i add, i just added it on my website and uh you know and started getting requests for uh, translations in crypto and um so I'm, I'm not saying you know one way or the other about mm -hmm. crypto but um you know if but and this is what i wrote in the article on linkedin is that um, you know you see something whether it's a fad or not? If you think it's going to last another say six months at least, mm -hmm. it might be worth you know putting the time and effort and energy into finding a way to make money from it. You know, and I uh, mean, and so yeah. Do you do that work yourself, or do you find people who sort of um, promote themselves as as experts translation translators so of crypto? I've, I found so what I did was I, I I did do it for myself. Now I, in my personal thing, I'm actually involved uh, with another company that is in crypto, and so um, and so I do know the terminology and I know um, you know what's needed and uh, and you know I know the difference between a crypto exchange or a swap or this like that because I noticed a lot of people you know with the lingo sometimes they get a uh -huh. bit confused. So I knew what to look for, and um, but. Uh, but I, you know, I looked for translators who know about crypto and, uh, you know, who felt comfortable with it. And, uh, you know, I wanted to get a couple together and, you know, so I could offer it at least mm -hmm. in some main language combinations and uh, which at, at least at the beginning, you know, were Italian, English and Chinese. But yeah. Do you, uh, do you, do you own any yourself? I do actually. What do you, because um, I've been I, thinking of getting into it, but I'm just nervous about it. So I, I, I bought, Bitcoin uh, almost 10 years or not 10 years ago, but anyway, seven years ago, something like that, completely forgot about it, forgot my password. To, <laughs> and then, you know, like five, six years later, I check and I see it had gone up by a lot and uh, I hadn't bought that much, but, um, and I was desperately trying to find the password to, and it, in fact, it was on, uh, it was on my old laptop and I finally found the password. And, um, and so I was able to make, uh, you know, a decent amount with that. Yeah. And, um, and then, so since then, I'm like, well, I'll, I'll put a bit here. And, uh, you know, the main things like Bitcoin, ETH and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I do have a bit of it. I, again, I don't, uh, I don't profess to know what's going to happen with the market, but uh, it, I think it'll be very interesting to see. I do think the technology is quite interesting. The technology itself underlying okay. everything. And so, um, and so, yeah, it's interesting to see what's going on there. That's one of the bonuses, I guess, of being a translator. That sort of thing allows you just to, to expand your knowledge as you're, as you're working, right, on these kinds of things. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I, I find it interesting to go through, you know, like when the bank contacted me or other things to see 
what these various companies and banks are, you know, doing in the crypto world and what they're working on. And so, um, yeah, it is quite interesting to see. Okay. I, I wanted to ask you actually a, uh, well, give me an example. So I, I, this is actually a real example from real life. I actually, it's funny that you're based in Taiwan. So I have a very good friend who's um, out and based in Taiwan. Actually, you know, she's Taiwanese rather. Uh, she's, uh, she owns her own art gallery, uh, actually in Edinburgh. Um, doing very well and she's written books art books um in taiwanese uh available in taiwan and uh she's been wanting to perhaps have them published translated uh, into into english so what would uh, what would she do then um to what what would your advice be to her just out of interest so she um, her native language is, is, uh, like she's from Taiwan. She Taiwan. is from she's Taiwan. Not, yeah. She just lives in, in, uh, in the, uh, in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. In the UK. Okay. She lived there a long um, time. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, so first of all, if she's been published before, then, you know, she should probably look into whether the publishing house owns the rights to her book or not, or, you know, how that works with, or even if she owns the, the rights to her book, she might want to see if the publishing house has contacts with translators who, um, you know, who translate into English or, uh, and, uh, you know, because they might, they might already have someone in place and they can kind of handle that stuff. Otherwise, if she wants to do it herself, then um, I would, I would uh, say to contact a Chinese to English translator, preferably someone who specializes in art. And um, well, and I mean, yeah, definitely someone who specializes in art or in something along those lines, art history okay. or whatever, you know, depending on, on what it is exactly. And, um, and yeah, you know, because I, no I noticed on your LinkedIn that you were talking about a, a grant that someone can apply for. Hang on. I need to find oh. it now again. Yeah. The grant was, mm. was offered basically by the Taiwanese government. You know, they, um, they're trying to promote, uh, Taiwanese literature abroad. And so it's a grant to, uh, translate, um, uh, Taiwanese, you know, literature from Taiwan into other languages. And uh, so actually that, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. She, she, she can, should try applying for that grant. Ah, here we go. So I found the, I found the post in question. Do you know a Chinese translator interested in translating books? If so, read on this grant recently came across my radar for translating Taiwanese books into other languages. So that if there's any of you, yeah, anyone's out there watching this in, uh, in, Taiwan so uh you think that's an av so that's so who should apply for that the customer or the client is well I, I, the, I uh, think the translator I think they mentioned publishing houses and um uh and possibly the translator them, themselves so if if your friend went there it's not like the the grant people would provide a translator I don't think but they would pay for the translator. And, they would, um, oh, okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, I think that I think that's what the grant entails. I I I uh, I don't know all the details, but I know they do offer a grant, and they're trying to promote it, so they'll subsidize something. And um, and yeah, uh, so she should probably either have her publishing house approach them, or she can approach them probably with a translator in mind. Okay, um, and then uh, and try to see. I, um, to one, I want to take you back a little bit to, and to more of your earlier days, and I think perhaps what maybe interests sort of younger translators or whatever is how you sort of, when, you take, when do you take that decision, okay, I want to be a translator, and then how do you advance from there, how do you get work, how do you get certification, do you get certification, does it depend where you live, what can you, what, from your, so from your experience, as I say, from working around the world quite a bit, what would you say there? Well, from my experience, it's, um, so yeah, because here it gets divided uh, quite a bit, and uh, especially in the people, the people who say you need a degree in translation to be a translator, if you want to be serious, and other people who say you don't, um, in my experience in Europe, it's a lot more common to have a degree in translation, while in the US it's not. Most people get a degree in something else, maybe their specialization, and later they'll get certified by the ATA, by some other uh -huh. organization in, trans in translation in their language combination. And uh, so you can go either route. And um, so I, I did not get a degree in translation myself. 
Um, and uh, so I studied, I studied business and economics, and uh, it was only later that, uh, that I got into translation. I, didn't, I did not think I would be a translator while I was in school or stuff like that. So how old and, were you uh, when you started getting into translation then? I was at, uh, in, my 20, in my late 20s, basically, I, um, because I did undergrad and then I worked uh, in Swiss, back in Switzerland. I worked at a bank. That's what Swiss people do when they study business or finance. And uh, then, yeah, I went to grad school to study economics and um, I, uh, and it was only, so, but during all this time, if I ever wanted extra cash, I would always, uh, at first I was tutoring as well, but I would always do translation. And I realized quite early on that I was good at translation, at least in translating, you know, finance, the topics that I knew about and, um, and that I sort of had a knack for it, but it was only after grad school that I thought finally, Hey, if this is my go-to every time I need extra cash. Why don't I try to make a living, you know, make this my career. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, then uh, that's, and so it was only after grad school basically that I started, you know, trying to uh, see if I could make a career out of it. And yeah, that's what happened. And at what point did you decide, okay, I mean, cause I used to translate m- myself, like before I started working, uh, working at the UN for quite uh, for a few years, Doing similar to, I think, what you did. I, I remember I got a lot of work on pros, pr- pros.com, for example. That, so we're talking here between 2006 to about 2009. Um, at right. what point then did you decide, okay, I don't want to just be translating, but I want to actually set up my own agency and start get and have other people do this work for me instead? Well, and that had always been, or not always, but pretty quickly that started being in the back of my head. You know, yeah, if I could have other people do this and I could be working on 11 languages at the same time rather than just one, wouldn't that be great? Of course, you realize pretty quickly that it's not just as easy as that. Um, and, uh, you know, it takes a lot of investment in finding the right translators, find reliable, trustworthy people to work with and uh, being able to handle it all and project manage it. And, but even before you do any of that, you need to be able to find the jobs and, uh, and you know, the clients. And um, I, but yeah, pretty early on, I had in the back of my mind that I wanted to try to push it and see how far I could take it. And uh, so I had my eye out for opportunities in that sense. And it sort of just happened to me. One of my clients, they needed a translation. I, I translate Italian to English and they needed, I think, Italian to English and, and Italian into French or something like that. And, um, and they asked me if I could work on it. I said, no. And, uh, and, but I said, but I, I do know a translator who can do this. And uh, so I remember the client, she, you know, she told me, she's like, look, if you can handle it yourself, I'll just pay you and you handle the whole thing. Basically I project manage the whole thing. Yeah. And I remember thinking, I'm like, oh, so this is, this will be my first foray into this and uh, seeing if I can handle it. And, um, and so, yeah, that's how it happened. And it was very organic and very tentative at first. And it took, actually a while before I decided, okay, I'm going to call myself an agency and actually right. treat it, you know, stop trying to see myself as a translator, but actually yep. run an agency. Yeah. Cool. And so how many yeah. people do you have working for you now then overall translators? Uh, I have, I mean, so regular translators is about 20, I would say, uh, maybe 21, 22, something like that. Um, I obviously have access to other translators that I work with, as I need them. And, uh, you know, I'm in touch with, I don't know, quite a number about maybe 50, I would say. Okay. And, um, and those, and there are others that I have been in touch with at least once or twice. And, uh, you know, so I, I know I can email them and stuff like that. And, uh, and that's quite a few, but I, I would say those are the numbers that I'm dealing with usually. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I am obviously a very small agency and, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm the one kind of running everything because you, you see, and by the way, you do talk to agencies, you hear about agencies. I talk to agencies all the time who say they'll have a database of like 30,000 translators or something like that. And those are always bogus, by the way, for all of you people out there. Obviously, no one has, um, you know, 30,000 translators at the same time. I mean, maybe, yeah, if you're TransPerfect or you're, uh, if you're, you know, LionBridge, one of those uh, big guys, then you have a huge number. But you hear about these agencies that you've never heard of before, and suddenly they have all this thing. Oh, this big number. And usually what that means is they just have that many people who signed up on their database. Okay. I probably have 
you know, I don't know, maybe 10,000 people, all, you know, who signed up on my database. Or, that or, many, or yeah, right. So but, when they give those well, figures, it's just everyone who's ever signed up on the database. Yeah, right? exactly. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, having a high number like that is good. You know, when you talk to prospective clients yes. and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, Dazzle so them with the big they, figures. Right, exactly. And so that's why very often they'll encourage you to fill out their form just so they can raise <laughs> the, their numbers. The numbers, and, right. Uh, it's all a numbers game. Right. right. But you're never going to hear back from them. And uh, so that's why the numbers I gave you now are the real numbers I work with, not uh -huh. the ones in my database, which, you know, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, how would somebody who is be interested in, in collaborating with you, um, what, what would, how would you advise them to sort of get onto your radar maybe? Well, the best way, the thing I always recommend is to go, if you go to my website, ruganotranslations.com, there's a sign up there that says, are you a translator? I think it literally says that you click on that. And then the, there's a form you fill out for established translators. And that way you get on my database. And so the database I have is actually one that I do access. So if I need a translator in, um, you know, that I don't have in a language combination, I don't often do like say Swedish to German or something like that. And uh, then I will go into my database and I'll see who's filled it out, Swedish to German. And if you're a language combination, uh, you know, specialization match, then I will be in touch with you. And, you know, so I can't promise anything uh, that I'll be in touch with you anytime soon or ever. But if and when uh, the language combination specialization pops up, I will be in touch with you and, uh, and we'll take it from there. And I always recommend that be the best way. Don't send cold emails. By the way, I recommend this for every agency you deal with, because I know a lot of people send out these cold emails. I'll get like 10 a day of these, uh, of these emails just saying, I'm a, so I'm a translator in this language combination and Built, you know, a whole thing just out of the blue. And um, usually, you know, people, they, they ignore those emails. They'll just delete yeah. them right away. I mean, I think uh, I get some on my LinkedIn, something like, you know, when you make a new sort of connection on LinkedIn, I get people right. just giving that sort of completely uh, generic thing saying, I'll do this, that, and the other. It's, uh... <laughs> right, exactly. And, and it's not, and so, and I, I don't know, people keep doing that. And I think it's just spray and pray. They kind of send out, a hundred yeah. emails a day. You can tell they're all copied and pasted and uh, they hope that one of them works out. I think it's a complete waste of time. You know, go to the, the website, go to the agencies, you know, the, their website, go to the .com. Chances are they have a database there and they want you to fill that out because it makes their life easier. You know, for me, at least their database, I can quickly search for people. I know who I need and, uh, you know, they filled out the criteria that I need. My, my form is very short, but it has exactly what I need. And, um, and so I think it's like that for most agencies. Okay, that's an important tip for you. So, Robert, he's been doing this for a long time. How long have you had? How long has your agency been uh, in existence Ag for? Agency has been around now close to ten years. Ten yeah, years, so right? It's, uh, yeah. So, so it's, um, it's been I, a while. I think Robert probably knows what he's talking about. So it's probably some good, a good tip. And what about for, sorry for clients for when you want to explain? I mean, are you looking to add take on more clients? How how's business sort of treating you these days? A uh, business is fine. It was it's been a roller coaster during the whole you know 2020, 2021 and uh, it looked really bad. Then it looked good for some odd reason. Then it looked bad again and everything like that. I think it's fine. It's different from what it was. I'm getting I lost some clients by getting clients from all new different places. LinkedIn has been great. Um, but, uh, you know, all in all, it's okay. And it's been doing fine. Um, but I'm always happy to <laughs> talk to prospective clients and get new clients. Absolutely. hundred percent. That's interesting and, what um, you say about LinkedIn. I mean, I was going to also ask you about what sort of your best, your preferred platforms are for, well, finding new clients for just, um, for just general professional, you know, expanding the business. So LinkedIn is your sort of go-to vehicle. It, more and more so. LinkedIn, I think, has been in the past few years, especially, has been become uh, huge. Uh, before it was, yeah, just cold marketing or else just referrals. Uh, usually, you know, past clients or you know people I'd worked with before, um, I was able to uh, you know to get referrals, get repeat business, stuff like that. Um, or yeah, just cold marketing out there and and and, uh, and whatnot. Like I said, I never did much face to face mark networking, and I'm yep. trying to do more of that in person stuff. Um, because I think that's important, and I like the, like remotely earlier. or actually in person. You're trying to meet people, as in physically. Well, well meet people physically, as yeah. you know, as permitted. You know, with everything. Actually, I should say I was a member of Carolina Association of Translators and Interpreters, Katie, 
And, um, but I never met them once face to face. So actually also <laughs> remotely, we, um, we did everything remotely cause that was all during COVID and, uh, you know, and yeah, so everything was done remotely there, but, um, uh, yeah, uh, now I, LinkedIn has just been for me at least. And for the people I see around me, it's been a lot's been happening there. Okay. I mean, it seems a good, yeah, it does seem the best way of, uh, I mean, I, 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 you're able to sort of build sort of a relationship quite quickly and there's interesting posts and it's uh, I like the fact that it just sort of sticks to professional stuff. That's why I, I dislike like the Facebooks and things like that. Instagram, right. it all just sways it goes off political far too easily. I like the fact LinkedIn, it just sort of, it's just sort of focused on the world of work. Um, I, I like that. Yeah, no, I think it's great. And in fact, I have a whole, you know, because now people do a lot of webinars and things online. Right. And I, I have a whole thing that I recommend, um, you know, where you go there and then, you know, you try to find the, um, the speaker, the organizers, anyone whose name is on the roster, you find them on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, you try to build a relationship that way because, okay. um, you know, if you can find a way by attending that webinar and then later continuing the conversation on LinkedIn, then that's actually a really good way to network. Uh -huh. you know, it's all online. That's and, another um, tip. Yeah. So it's, uh, so yeah, I found LinkedIn to be very good and it's, it's a good way to vet people because they're not out of the blue because right away you can see their whole history, uh -huh. professional history. And, uh, so yeah, no LinkedIn's. Been so yeah, if you, good. if you're looking for work, I guess you really want to, uh, you really want to carefully cultivate that LinkedIn profile. eh? it's very important. Yeah. I, and I, and I recommend that for freelance translators, as you know, I, uh, you know, help them out with, uh, with the channel and everything else. And I always recommend that, yeah, having your LinkedIn, you, you should have your LinkedIn channel. Pros.com as well is still very important uh -huh. for translators. Um, and, and, you know, those profiles should be tip top. Um, what was it? Well, I mean, one thing I always thought with interpreters and translators when I see people on LinkedIn, if I was like look, really looking actively for work, I'd always make it, want to make it clear right from the off in your little bio what language combination you had. That's just, that's what it seems to, what, what do you think about that? I mean, I, when I see someone, I want to know exactly what languages they, they offer. Yes, absolutely. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things that you should not only put what language you offer, but you should spell it out. Because a lot of people like to put the abbreviation uh -huh. like ES uh -huh. to EN. And, I'm, you know, but that way you're completely not searchable. And in fact, a lot oh, of- Oh, yeah, is that right? Clients, well, I mean, no one's going to search for ES. You know, they're going to search for Spanish to English translator. And, uh, and in a fact- a lot of people oh. not in the industry, they don't even know what ES means, you know, they, and, uh, and so um, that's why I always say spell out the whole language, you know, and um, because you want to be certain. That's a really good tip, right isn't it? Yeah, because you always just put yeah English. I mean, you always put English or Russian or whatever. You never put in the abbreviation, right? Yeah, and, and uh, exactly. So I, I recommend, yeah, spell out the whole thing. Because I, I see a lot of people just loving to put those abbreviations or just a flag or something, and the flag is great because it's recognizable. But you want to be searchable as well. And the you see, I thought the flag would be a good thing, but again, yeah, you want to be yeah, or have the flag and the and the name. But right, yeah, make sure both, that yeah. you're searchable. Okay. Uh, so coming back then to yeah, sort of younger into younger translators working their way up. So certification. Do you, I mean, what, which way do you think what, the European system works better or the American system, which is less focused on the certification is better? What do you think? Where's the quality? Is there a difference in the quality? D discernible? I, so I'll, I'll tell you this much. And so actually, I, I, because I, I work well with translators from both systems and, um, and so that's been fine. But and I the Asian know, system as well, right? Yeah, an Asian system as well, definitely. And uh, you know, once you, it's like with everything. Once you start working, it's the work itself that matters more than than uh, what you did before. Like you know, once you kind of get into it. But in order to get into it, for example, I work with legal translators and two people. If everything else is the same, but one of them got a degree in translation and the other one went to law school, chances are I'll work better with the person who went to law school. And okay. uh, just because I know that they're familiar with all the legal terminology and all the intricacies involved, usually in both languages, but even if only just in their native tongue, they know what to look for exactly. And they'll know, you know, what to search out for and the difference between this and that, and, and uh, you know, not to get, not to fall into that trap. And um, this might depend on specializations, but I know, you know, by and large, 
that's been my experience. Um, you know, at least we deal, like I said, with legal and uh, business translations. And so at least definitely in the legal world, that's been my experience. And, um, and so, but, you know, like I said, I work with plenty of uh, people who, you know, legal translators who studied translation, got a degree in translation, um, but then, you know, for some reason or another, uh, ended up specializing in, in law and, uh, and are excellent as well. Okay. But by and large, that's uh, like, generally speaking, that, that's, that's my impression. And I know I, I might get flack from it from people who do de- get a degree in translation. Um, but uh, like, a, a, like I said, I'm, that's a gross generalization. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, what about in terms of like the new technologies that are developing and the extent to which translators need to be sort of um, proficient in being able to use them? Because, okay, when I was translating, I mean, when I did that, that spell of three or four years, when I was translating, it was still pretty much the old fashioned way. Okay, you had a computer and all that, but you do the translation, you find a word that you weren't certain of, then you go and look it up in the dictionary and put it in and carry on like that. That's the sort of old analog way, I guess, of translating, right? Yeah. But now, from what I gather, speaking to colleagues, people at work, people on YouTube, people via LinkedIn, it's all changed now, right? It's a lot more, there's, there's more to it. Well, there's, there's ways to certainly speed up your, speed up your work and increase your output. Um, oh, there, yeah, there's a lot of technology out there from, you know, machine translation, there's some MTPE is a big thing that you see now, MTPE. CAT tools, obviously, uh, machine translation, post editing. Um, okay. And uh, so here, that's where people hire you. They already had a machine translated and they hire you as an editor after. Oh, wait. oh okay, right. Yeah. And then there's some disasters in there, although there, there are some, you know, because it depends on the quality of the machine translation. And, but all too often people, this means they're using Google Translate, don't know what they're doing, and then they'll send you this text. And, you know, you don't know what, half the time it means you need to go back and retranslate the whole thing. And, and it's a pain. Although there are some, like I've, I've heard, so a couple companies like have their own, like IBM, I think has its own machine translation, which is supposedly really good. I remember yeah. talking to some translators who said it's actually a pleasure working with theirs and they're able to do, you know, high volume, blah, blah, blah. So it, it really does depend. And, but that's the thing, this machine translation, when you're talking like Deepl, Deepl. Uh, Deepl you know, the one like I've that. heard about a lot, right? Right. Uh, and uh, stuff like that. They can, they're actually good tools. And um, if they're in the hands of people who know what they're doing, if it's just a random company that decides they want to save money and they run it through this machine translation first and then, uh, and then hand it to an editor or maybe don't even hand it to an editor, just use that, then it can be a complete disaster. And, um, but that's why I say as translators, we should keep up with this technology. We shouldn't be Luddites about it because it can actually be a good help. And if you know what to look for and you know that machine translation is going to have issues with a lot of things like metaphors, similes, innuendo, humor, stuff like that, you know, you know what to look out for or complicated legalese, um, you know, double negatives, you know, stuff like that, then you know what to look out for. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you can actually use this tool quite well. Um, but an amateur or someone who just decides to use it to save, you know, like the end client just using it to save money, it can be a disaster. Because this is what and, you were uh, saying so, is that the big yeah. problem is the, the way the clients actually use it, right? They try, they're too reliant on it and they think it's just like magic. It'll just magically give them a a like for like, just like that, right. a like for like translation. And unfortunately, and uh, yeah, because a lot of people, what you hear about in the news is stuff like, oh, with AI, now we can translate everything. We don't need translators, blah, blah, blah. Google Translate, Google Translate. E- except then you have issues like, um, uh, like I, I posted recently about um, Amazon when it launched right. in Sweden, it relied on AI for all of, its, uh, all of its translations. And it ended up having quite a few sexual innuendos or sexual things that were not supposed to be there because uh, apparently yeah it was a complete mess. this this was another and, post you put up on linkedin wasn't it yes but uh yeah so that was uh that was interesting <laughs> yeah i mean this is an issue we face again in in interpreting this is our no, sort really. of this, this this thing that's looming <laughs> that's gonna take our jobs at some point like the the artificial you know instead you know so instead of just having us sitting there in the booths what the delegates say would just automatically get processed by some sheen which would just deliver flawless mono, a flawless monotone uh interpretation rendering of our work 
So um, we'll, we'll see how. I, yeah. I, I, and I mentioned this to you before, but I think one reason why you don't need to be as scared as you might be is that these, you know, this machine translation, it learns and, and it has to learn by getting new inputs. But that means that every time you plug in new inputs, um, it, uh, it captures what you said. And chances are the text is there somewhere, whatever you talked about is there somewhere. So if you have text that's confidential, and this is definitely true with Google Translate, by the way, people love using Google Translate. Okay. If you use it for anything confidential, like legal contracts, um, you know, I'm, I'm, hospitals, governments, uh, you know, stuff like that, they all have confidential information. You plug it into Google Translate, um, it, you know, it has to learn from all the translations it gets. And so the text you put in there is actually retrievable there in its databases somewhere. And, uh, and so that can be very much an issue. And I, so I think humans will always be there because they can be more anonymous than machines that are spreading everything out through the right. cloud. And um, so, uh, so yeah, it's uh, anyway. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, with interpretation, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've got, I've got to get tw 20 years till I retire. Uh, 18, 18 years till I retire. I think I'll be all right. I think I'll be all right. I think I'm glad I've got the, the Russian, for example. I think if these things happen, it might be with um, languages, let's say, whose syntaxes are more similar, like I don't know, English and French. The syntax is fairly similar-ish, you know, in terms of one word for one word. Um, Spanish are less so, and Russian completely different sort of syntax from uh, from English so uh, I think it also might depend on the uh, the difficulty of the language uh, involved so yeah, yeah and but it, it also I mean I guess it also depends on yeah how much slang is being used and stuff like that because I remember when I was working in transcription I was amazed at how much yeah I mean yeah the slang changes but also how often it's misused but we understand what people mean and even if we use the wrong type of word, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example. I remember doing a transcription. Some guy kept saying, he's like, oh yeah, but that was off the wall. That's off the wall. But he kept meaning, he kept using it to mean like, oh, but that's off topic. He's like, da -da -da -da. he's like, anyway, that's off the wall. What I meant was da -da -da -da. <laughs> And obviously that's not what off the wall means. But yeah. You understand it if you're a person, but. Yes, if a machine machine's might, saying it. Yeah. And there's there the example um, it, that, uh, that you hear about. Um, Time flies like the wind, fruit flies like bananas. So that's something that um, time flies like the <laughs> I've wind. I've never heard that. Yeah, yeah, because it's something, you know, we, we can tell the difference. Time flies like the wind, we know yeah. what you're saying. Fruit flies like bananas. Uh, we know that that's completely different, but it shows how an AI, it, it won't necessarily be able to tell the difference. Are time flies a type of fly? Time flies yeah, like yeah, yeah. wind? Do they, do they like and? And, and so it kind of shows, um, yeah, things that we don't even think about that are natural to us, but these can be very different for AI and for machines to learn. Okay. Um, and uh, so I, I remember any, yeah, reading about that. And, and I thought that was an interesting analogy, an interesting example. Yeah. But anyway, anyway so, so, so translators, they should really, that as part of their toolkit, they, they really should have a good, a decent knowledge then of the, uh, the platforms that exist, the various tools that exist today. It's not just simply a question of, it's not just a question anymore of just being good at languages, just translating from one language to another. There's, there's, there's more to it, right? Yeah. And, and I think it, it can be a, a, a tremendous help if you, um, again, if you know what you're doing mm. and uh, you know, the, the te technology is out there. So why not use whatever's available to help you out? And, um, you know, and if you don't find it helpful, don't use it, obviously. But if you if you find it helpful, use it. Um, you know, there's no reason not to. And especially if you are a professional translator, you, you can use it well. And uh, so you might as well. Has it pushed the price per word down a lot? Have you noticed? And your, I mean, how, has, how has that changed in your 10 years? I mean, the rates for per, because that's what it is in translation, right? Generally per word. Has per word, that, yes. Has there been a significant change as a result of all these technologies? Yes, uh, but I would say the change has been, well, I mean, definitely because of technologies, I'm sure, uh, but mostly because of the internet. Um, yeah. They were a lot, so when I started getting into translation, there was already the internet, but you had the remnants of the other world still. Yeah. And it was, um, 
and you know, in those towns where if you had, you know, you met all your clients face to face and shook their hand and, uh, and you know, you were all in the same metro area. Yeah. You know, these translators could command prices that were crazy compared to now. And, um, but, uh, you know, the internet was a great equalizer and kind of, uh, brought, brought it all down. Um, I don't think, cause now you find some places that are dirt cheap, uh, but that, um, uh, you know, like when I hire translators and I'll get people who will offer to do it dirt cheap, I know that you get what you pay for in, uh, you know, almost all the, all those cases. And, uh, yeah. I have always, I, you know, what I charge is in the cheapest, but I always have very good quality tra translations and what I pay my translators is a good price. And I don't think it's gone down b due to uh, machine translation per se. Uh, I think it, no. yeah, you know, maybe, maybe the internet stuff like that, but um, yeah, it's uh, again, this is just anecdotal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I don't think, I don't think it has. Um, but uh, you know, I might be mistaken. But yeah, how, how do you just, one thing? How do you ensure the quality control? And for all these languages that a lot of we don't speak, how how do you make sure that uh, the client is so, going to get his money's worth? Yeah. So that's always been. So what I do um, when I hire people, when when you hire, is is the most difficult. But um, for all my translations, I have four eyes. I have the translator and I have an editor. And so I have the translator work on it. Uh, send it to me and then I send it to the editor who, who is paid to find mistakes and uh, in the original translation. And so <clears throat> usually what this means in the long term is basically that I'll have a translator and editor who work well together. And uh, so the translator will do something and the editor will, um, you know, read through it and say, this is good. I would just change this because then it sounds a bit better. The translator will be like, okay, that's fine. And, um, and that's usually what I can get after a while when I have a good translator and a good editor. And uh, that's how I can maintain a good, uh, ma maintain good quality. At the very beginning, when you're hiring them, you know, you kind of have to, I start with small translations and, uh, you know, I, and, and you have to test quite a bit more, but, um, but yeah, for all my translations, I always uh, have that. So you have that's a sort why of I said team. We're not the mm. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said, we're not the cheapest out there, but we have a good quality. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, okay. Well, just to conclude, um, what sort of plans have you got then? I know you're starting uh, sort of uh, on your YouTube channel, you've got some plans for a new series. What can, uh, what can the viewers look out for there? What can they be expecting to see there? So we recently started a series with Lucas, who is a, a translator who's just starting out and he, um, decided to uh, document his journey as a freelance translator from, it's called From Source to Target, the, the series. And uh, he's starting from, uh, yeah, just starting out as a translator to trying to get his first clients. He got a client actually. And then, um, and uh, you know, it is just documenting his growth as a translator. And I think it's very interesting because a lot of translators, when they're starting out, I think it's, it's good to see someone else who's in your same shoes and what right. they go through day after day. And now, uh, now that the technology is available, eh? now you can see how you. Because I know you did a lot of that for yourself, right? A lot of your sort of videos were sort of everyday, yeah. the, the everyday things, right? Well, yeah, I did mine, and uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, my book and my course and all that because no one was explaining how to be a freelance translator at the time. People talked about being a translator, you know, going to school, getting your degree or something like that, but not about the freelance part. And it was annoying that I felt like I had to reinvent the wheel. And, um, you know, when other people had obviously done it, but no one was talking about how to do it. Yeah. And uh, that really frustrated me. So yeah, also with the YouTube channel, when I set it up, that, that was my intent there. Uh, what What's your book say? called? Oh, What's your book called? How to be a successful freelance translator. Very same as the course. It's a uh, yeah, very, uh, yeah. Um, Easy, I'll be I'll be I'll be putting the links in the uh, in the description box so you'd be able to I'll, I'll put links to uh, well, I'll put links to uh, Robert's YouTube channel to the book if <laughs> you can buy it online presumably yeah Amazon it's there it's um yeah you can uh, get a Kindle or you can uh, order the physical book either way when when, when was it published when did, uh, when, when did it come out February twenty twenty. No, okay, so it's pretty recent. Yeah, two pretty years recent. anyway. Yeah. 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 
and um and so yeah it's uh and, and it has everything from a to z and yeah you know exactly I, I wanted to create something that's uh very has everything for reference but is also very actionable so it's you know one of those you start and you can start right away you know following it and doing the work yourself and so you make sure that uh you know you can get up and running as quickly as possible and it's about um, setting up your own business i mean turning into like an, an agency ultimately as well or no so i have a section at the very end saying if you want to become an agency you know here's here's some uh -huh. tips and stuff no but the, the book itself deals with being a freelance translator okay so it deals with what, what you need ahead of time you know before starting like you need an online profile you need resume you know stuff like that and then um and you know and then goes into okay what's the next step what's the next step and i in fact i put in things like this first step you know will take you half a day Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if, if you already have a resume written out, it'll take you this long. And so you can, you can plan it because yeah, they're preparing yourself. Like a lot of people feel like they want to do it, but it's too much effort and they don't want to get started and they kind of delay it. And I don't want people to delay it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if you, you can do all the prep, pre preparation in one weekend and, you know, and then get started that Monday, actually searching for jobs and, uh, and right. trying to uh, get going. And, uh, and that's really what I try to do with this book uh, and the course, you know, I, I try to make it actionable so people can hit the ground running and, um, and, you know, and then start finding clients, finding the right clients, being able to uh, market themselves, deal with, and it, you know, it talks about payments, it talks about uh, invoicing, it talks about, you know, everything you'll need, you know, along every step along the way. Just out of interest, uh, in terms of setting up your company, could you basically set your company up where, I mean, where's your company registers? It registers like as a Swiss company or? So I, it was originally, now I, I don't believe I have a Swiss company anymore. Um, and it's registered in the US. I, I still have it registered in the US and, uh, and here in Taiwan. Oh, okay. So, so both, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, this, and this changes uh, from, place to place. And if, if you're a freelancer, you don't really need to set up your own company, but depending on where you live, you might need to worry a bit about employment laws. Right. Uh, that's where you are. But if you are working online, it's not that much of a problem. Um, you know, but a lot of places, if you're there on a tourist visa, stuff like that, you know, you shouldn't technically be working. So, you know, you, um, you, uh, yeah, you know, be careful. Right. That's good. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Good advice. Okay, so um, if you want to contact Robert or his company, so as he says, the best way thing to do then is to 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 go to Lugano Translations, right, and uh, fill in the form. Yes, and you. Oh, sorry. Before I forget, there's another series on my channel that uh, deals with um, that we just started dealing with cat tools in general, and yeah. uh, because uh, we have an expert in cat tools, and he's. Uh, and he's he's he has one video out dealing with WordFast, and he's going to be talking about different cat tools because I know that's a big thing for translators. And uh, I'm not really an expert in cat tools, and so I'm glad to have an expert talking about it there. And um, I would really like to have someone come on my channel talk about interpreting at some point as well. If you know any <laughs> interpreters, <laughs> any interpreters. <laughs> um, no, I, I know we had the interview a while ago, but um, yeah, I, I still do get questions about interpreting and. Um, Obviously, I know nothing about it, unfortunately. But what we're saying, yes, no, to get in touch with me, absolutely. You can go to my, uh, you can go to the website. If, you're, if you want to be on the database, you go to luganotranslations.com. It says, are you a translator? And you, you can just, uh, there, there have all sorts of resources, including, by the way, links to the book and the course and everything, but, um, and, uh, and the YouTube channel as well. But uh, yeah, you have a form you can fill out and you'll be on my database. Absolutely, you can do that. And if you're a client, you can click on, quote or free quote or something like that and uh you can fill out the information and i can give you a free quote for whatever translation you might need brilliant well that ladies and gentlemen was robert gebhardt for you if you have your own agency if you're sort of up and coming in the business and you want to sort of put your name out as robert did today as phil did previously you can come on to the uh, the interpretation station you get a free you get to plug yourself be interesting to speak to people maybe who in, in africa for example we have let's say phil was what more europe based robert's more sort of uh asia based so if any guys out there in africa you've got your own business your own translation business going i'd love to have you on the show we can have a chat to see what the situation is out there so as i say i'm going to put all the links the interesting stuff about uh, that robert mentioned in the description box go look uh, robert up also on, on linkedin 
he's always got some interesting posts there and uh yeah well any any final words robert from you no thank you once again for uh having me on your channel and uh it's been a pleasure as always to talk to you and we've managed to record it this time nothing's gone i, th I think everything's gone right, right yeah on this that would be good yeah if it's recorded this time yeah good <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that leaves me with nothing more to say then. That well, just keep following me in the interpretation station, sharing, liking, subscribing. All the usual jazz, and all that remains to be said is that episode 125 of the interpretation station stands adjourned. The train is now leaving the interpretation station. We hope you enjoyed what you're doing, and until next time, folks.